In nearly two centuries of American political history, two political parties have been embedded in our politics, so enshrined in the functioning of our government that no other parties have ever posed a real threat to their existence — the Democrats and the Republicans. But with every presidential election, especially where the two major party candidates seem weak, out of touch, or operate contrary to the wishes and well-being of a large swath of the voting public, the most dissatisfied voters have turned their sights and their hopes on the one available solution against entrenched and disconnected politicians — third-party candidates. These candidates often offer fresh perspectives, take risks on stances that no major party candidate would ever take, and appeal to working class and other voters who feel they aren't being properly represented by the leaders in Washington. And so, those dissatisfied voters make the conscientious choice to say, hey, these big guys aren't working for me. I'm voting third party. Take that. And the third party candidate gets anywhere from 0 to 19 percent of the popular vote, resulting in maybe a handful of electoral votes, but ultimately, the big guys always win anyway. Why is that? Why is it impossible in American politics to elect a third party candidate for president? Why do they keep running anyway? Is it valid to vote for a third party candidate when you know there's a 0 percent chance they will take the presidency? Are third party candidates the answer to our political divide and the politicians who seem unconcerned with listening to the people and acting in their best interest? The answer? Probably not. At least not in this system. But it's more complicated than you think. This is why third party candidates aren't the answer you think they are. Thank you to Factor for partnering with me on today's video. I've been working on my fitness lately and trying to meal plan every week so I can keep on track with my goals. But meal planning is hard, y'all. Factor makes it way easier, though. They deliver fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. They have a team of gourmet chefs. So when you order Factor, that means you have a team of gourmet chefs. Fancy! You'll have over 35 different options to choose from every week, including keto, vegetarian, and more, so you can easily plan your meals no matter your goals. I recently tried their garlic mushroom chicken thighs with creamy cauliflower rice and garlic green beans. So creamy! So delicious! The green beans? Still tender crisp. I don't know how they do it. They also have breakfasts, snacks, smoothies, and these delicious little wellness shots. So they have you covered for every meal of the day. And there's no prep and no mess, which as an ADHD girly, you know I love that. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code LEGIA50 to get 50% off your first box and free wellness shots for life. You get two free wellness shots from three available flavors for every order while you're an active subscriber. Fun! Thanks, Factor! The 2024 election is a presidential race primed for third-party candidates. I already made a whole video about how no one wants either of the guys running, and Democrats especially are dissatisfied by the very apparent disconnect between the people sitting atop Capitol Hill in Washington and the needs and desires of the general voting public. An October 2023 Gallup poll found that 63 percent of Americans agree that a third major party is needed because Democrats and Republicans are doing such a bad job at representing the American people. Because of this, some news outlets are deeming this the year of the third party candidate. Of course, not saying one will win, but saying, oh yeah, we're thinking real hard about them this year. And they might affect the ultimate outcome of the election, not because the third party candidate will win, but because they may take votes away from one side or the other. But who are these third party candidates that are so alluring? Two weeks ago, we talked about Marianne Williamson and Dean Phillips as primary challengers to Biden and why no one else is seriously challenging him from within the Democratic Party. That's not who I'm talking about today. I'm talking about candidates running from outside the established two-party system, either as independents, meaning someone unaffiliated with any party, or as the official nominee of an established third party. Now, there have been dozens of third parties throughout the United States, some I've never heard of, like the Alaskan Independence Party, the Independent Republican Party, and the Best Party very subtle. Only very few of these parties qualify to have their candidates printed on election ballots outside of the single states where they happen to have gained some traction. And each state has their own fluctuating criteria for how to qualify for the ballot. As of 2022, only three parties, besides Democrats and Republicans, were recognized in at least 10 states. 
the Libertarian Party, the Green Party, and the Constitution Party. According to the platform on the Libertarian Party website, as libertarians, we seek a world of liberty, a world in which all individuals are sovereign over their own lives and are not forced to sacrifice their values for the benefit of others. Basically, they're the fuck the government, don't tell me what to do, I'll bury my money and gold bricks under the tree behind the barn, Ron Swanson, Party of America. <laughs> Well said. The Green Party sees itself as a grassroots movement promoting 10 key values. Grassroots democracy, social justice and equal opportunity, ecological wisdom, nonviolence, decentralization, community-based economics, feminism and gender equity, respect for diversity, personal and global responsibility, and future focus and sustainability. Basically, Republicans' worst nightmare. According to the Constitution Party's website, the party supports the principles of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States, and the Bill of Rights. It is our goal to limit the federal government to its delegated, enumerated constitutional functions. Basically, a Republican wet dream. And then there's a group that calls themselves No Labels. They're not an official third party, but I would be remiss not to mention them in a video about third party candidates because they've been part of the national conversation lately and have been threatening to promote an unnamed third party candidate for the 2024 election to challenge the Trump-Biden ticket. No Labels was founded in 2010 by Nancy Jacobson, a Democratic fundraiser with a history of organizing for new Democrats like Gary Hart and Bill Clinton. It aimed to foster a new kind of politics by finding common ground between the Republican and Democratic parties, rooted in the belief that there was a substantial, silent majority of Americans whose common sense approach to governance was being overlooked in favor of partisan bickering. Initially, No Labels didn't intend to form a third party, but rather sought to exert pressure on politicians from both established parties to encourage cooperation, civility, and bipartisanship. Despite its limited grassroots success, No Labels has played a significant role in the creation of the Problem Solvers Caucus, a bipartisan group in Congress with a mixed record of legislative achievements. The organization has been particularly supportive of figures like Representative Josh Gottheimer and Senator Kirsten Sinema, who've positioned themselves as moderates willing to oppose elements of their own party's agenda, including significant parts of President Joe Biden's Build Back Better proposal. Despite starting as a Democratic-leaning, though unaffiliated organization, No Labels attempt to, well, defy labels, has led to a confusing platform that isn't so much bipartisan as it is questionable and murky. Financially, No Labels is backed by donors from the investment, real estate, and venture capital sectors, including figures who have supported both major parties but tend to oppose social spending initiatives and efforts to increase taxes or regulate the financial industry. This has led to speculation about the true motives behind No Labels activities and the potential impact of its dark money funding. The centrism championed by No Labels, critics argue, often aligns more closely with the interests of its wealthy donors than with those of the broader American public they claim to represent. They haven't announced a candidate, but they have been threatening to push for a new third party candidate under the proper environmental conditions, whatever that means. As for the other prominent third parties, I couldn't find much information on who's running for the Constitution Party's nomination, though they are holding a national convention in Salt Lake City in April. A man named Chase Oliver is running for the Libertarian Party nomination. He ran as a Libertarian in the 2022 Georgia Senate election that led to a runoff between Raphael Warnock and Herschel Walker. Walker, ultimately deciding the majority of the U.S. Senate. Some argue that Oliver, who won 2.1% of the vote, caused that runoff election by taking just enough votes that neither Warnock nor Walker could hit that 50% mark. Jill Stein is once again running for the Green Party nomination. She ran for president on the Green Party ticket in both 2012 and 2016. In her video announcing her candidacy, she called for an economic bill of rights, including guaranteed right to employment, health care, housing, food, and education. She won 1.4 million votes in the 2016 election and some blame her for Hillary Clinton's loss that year, reasoning that those 1.4 million voters would have voted for Clinton if Stein wasn't running. Subsequent analysis has found that it's unlikely the case that Clinton would have won if Stein hadn't been in the running because most of her voters would have just not voted because they didn't want Trump or Clinton. And it's yet to be seen what kind of momentum Jill Stein's 2024 presidential bid will gain in the next nine months. Besides Chase Oliver and Jill Stein, there are two other candidates running for president as independents, unaffiliated with any specific party. Those candidates are Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Cornell West. Cornell West is an academic and activist who's taught at Yale, Princeton, and Harvard, and is currently a professor of philosophy at Union Theological Seminary. He's incredibly progressive and also has been sharply critical of the Obama presidency. Some polling suggests he could win as much as 6% of the popular vote, though polling at this stage is incredibly unreliable and usually third party candidates fare much worse in the actual election than polls ahead of time suggest. And then there's Robert F. Kennedy Jr 
the nephew of JFK, who initially ran for the Democratic nomination before switching to Independent in October. Kennedy has garnered notoriety for being a prominent anti-vaccine advocate, promoting the debunked claim that childhood vaccines are linked to autism, and frequently railing against COVID-19 vaccine mandates and other pandemic measures. This guy used to be an environmental lawyer and he worked to clean up the Hudson River. This is a classic organic hippie to anti-vaxxer pipeline scenario. He's also promoted conspiracy theories about 5G networks being used for mass surveillance. And there was also an infamous incident in which he shared a video of himself bench pressing shirtless, which made alpha males everywhere salivate on Twitter. Now listen, this guy's 70, he looks great. And we have a weird tendency in this country, and probably just in human nature, to assume that athletic fitness makes someone a good fit for president. For the record, it doesn't, just so we're clear. But on top of well-defined biceps, RFK also has the name recognition that comes along with being a Kennedy, something most third-party candidates lack. And he has the benefit of Trump priming millions of Americans to support candidates who say the edgy things no one else will say, which makes them assume that means that he's of the people and speaking their language. And while Trump has years of political baggage and nearly 100 criminal counts hanging over his head at this point, Kennedy has the benefit of at least appearing purely political and of the people because of his name, despite the fact that both men are in their 70s and have been millionaires since birth. And because anti-vaxxers and anti-government circles have coalesced because of the COVID-19 pandemic, that means Kennedy's audience has grown immensely in the last five years. And he's been on prominent podcasts, including those hosted by venture capitalists, as well as Joe Rogan's, Megyn Kelly's, Jordan Peterson's, and Russell brand. He seems to be speaking to the people who no longer trust the government and are looking for an outsider to speak truth to power. Again, people forget he's a Kennedy, which is the very literal opposite of an outsider, but understanding that requires a few more critical thinking brain cells than I think a lot of his supporters can muster. But because of this massive growth in his audience over recent years, RFK Jr. poses the biggest third party threat in the upcoming election. And the major parties know this. In early February, the Democratic National Committee filed a complaint with the federal election commission against RFK, accusing him of illegally coordinating a $15 million petition drive with a super PAC backing his presidential race. The complaint accused the arrangement of violating federal campaign finance laws and breaching long-established financial barriers between candidates and outside groups. But you know who doesn't give a shit about enforcing campaign finance laws usually? The DNC and the RNC. They wouldn't be filing this complaint if they saw it as a minor threat that was below them. But they see that he's gaining steam and working hard to get his name on ballots across the country in the 2024 general election. And frankly, they should be scared. A recent Harris poll found that 48% of Americans had a favorable opinion of RFK. And another poll found that 21% of respondents would either definitely or probably vote for Kennedy as an independent in November, 21%. Again, polls for third party candidates tend to be greatly inflated ahead of the race, but those are numbers the DNC can't write off. That being said, the results of the poll also showed that Kennedy was pulling voters equally from Biden and Trump, though more Democrats viewed him unfavorably at 55% than Republicans, of which only 17% have an unfavorable view of Kennedy. So it's unclear whether RFK's candidacy, should he make it to the ballot in November, would really impact the outcome of the presidential race. Because of the disillusionment with our two-party system, his votes, once again, might simply be coming from voters who, absent a third party option wouldn't show up to vote at all. And the increased apathy and dissatisfaction among voters indicates that this year might have many, many people who feel that way. However, this isn't the first presidential election where people felt dissatisfied with their choices in the two-party general election. Nor is this the first presidential election happening during a tumultuous time domestically and internationally. And while no third party candidate has won the presidency since Democrats and Republicans became the two dominant parties, many third party candidates have created movements movements and changed the national conversation and made a dramatic impact on the outcome of our presidential elections over the years. And we can learn a lot from looking to the lessons of the past. It's not a coincidence that many notable third party candidates cropped up around the turn of the 20th century, a time known as the Gilded Age, where industrialization had concentrated the wealth into the hands of the few, while the many toiled away doing backbreaking physical labor with no protections so that the few at the top could continue to enrich themselves. And while today we have labor laws to protect us against hourly work with no overtime pay and protect against making children work in the coal mines, etc., we have seen a repeat of this process 
in the digital age. Employees working 16-hour days on salaries that haven't budged in over a decade in order to enrich billionaires who are ruining the planet and shooting rocket ships to the moon. The wealthy are out of touch now, and they were at the turn of the 20th century as well, leading many to push for populist candidates who fought against the establishment. This started with James Weaver running as the People's Party candidate in 1892. The party championed the cause of small farmers and the working class, advocating for federal regulation of the railroads and progressive labor labor policies. He won 1 million popular votes and 22 electoral votes, forcing the major parties to address the demands of the working class. Four years later, William Jennings Bryan ran as the candidate for both the Democratic and the People's Parties, also advocating for small farmers and the working class. The election was hotly contested, with voter turnout passing 90% of eligible voters in many jurisdictions. McKinley ultimately prevailed, but William Jennings Bryan won 46.7% of the popular vote, showing the potential that third-party movements had for impacting major party platforms and the national political dialogue. Joke's on McKinley, though, I guess, because he was assassinated five years later in 1901. Eugene V. Debs was another prominent activist at the turn of the century. Back when I made a whole video about whether someone can run for president from prison, hint, yes they can, Debs featured prominently because he did just that. But that wasn't even his most impressive run. Debs was a labor organizer and socialist activist who helped organize the largest union strike in U.S. history at the end of the 1800s to fight against monopolization and unfair labor practices in the railroad industry. Debs would run for president five times, most notably in 1912, when he won a million popular votes, 6% of the total vote, not enough to win any electoral votes, but enough to bring socialism to the forefront of the national conversation for the first time, leading to decades of socialist activity in the U.S. until the anti-communism crusade of the 40s and 50s shut that down for good. After McKinley's assassination in 1901, Teddy Roosevelt took the presidency and then won his own term in 1904. When Taft took over in 1908, he moved the Republican Party farther to the right than Teddy was comfortable with. Reminder that this was back when Republicans were more progressive and Democrats were more conservative. Because of this movement, Roosevelt decided to run for president again in 1912, this time with his own third party. Theodore Roosevelt's Progressive Party showcased the significant impact that a third party bid could have when it was led by a charismatic and popular figure. Roosevelt's new nationalism platform, which advocated for broad social reforms and stricter business regulations, split the Republican vote and facilitated Democrat Woodrow Wilson's victory. Roosevelt came in second to Wilson, making his 1912 campaign one of the most successful third-party efforts in U.S. history. Now, a handful of other third-party candidates made impressive showings throughout the 20th century, but I want to jump ahead in time to 1992 and a little man named Ross Perot. This is where these third-party ideas start to make the 2016 election make a lot more sense. Reminder that Trump is 77, meaning that in 1992, when Ross Perot ran, Trump was 45 and already politically motivated. He had tried to throw his hat into the race to be George H.W. Bush's vice president in 1988, which Bush wrote off as strange and unbelievable. But Trump was well-connected. If you Google it, you can find pictures of Trump with every president since Nixon. And by the 90s, he was paying attention. In 1992, Perot ran as an independent on the nostalgic idea of bringing back Norman Rockwell-esque simpler times and took a hardline stance on immigration and drugs that spoke to many conservatives. But he also was moderate when it came to abortion and gay rights, making him appeal to a number of liberals as well. He used folksy sayings and charmed many Americans who saw him as the anti-politician, something that seems to sucker voters in in every century. Despite being folksy, he was also a populist billionaire who had zero political experience, promised to disrupt the system, touted economic nationalism, liked conspiracy theories, used childish taunts to mock his opponents, and relied on his wealth for his celebrity. Sound familiar? Perot went on to win 20 million votes, 19% of the popular vote. He later founded the Reform Party and ran again in 1996, though with much weaker results. Four years after that, Trump seriously considered running for president on the Reform Party ticket, Ross Perot's own party, in 2000. The 2000 election would also provide ample fodder for the Trump playbook that would take shape in 2016. However, instead of Trump, it was Pat Buchanan who ultimately ran under the Reform Party banner in the 2000 election. In Buchanan's view, Republicans were no longer conservative enough. He's been called the father of culture war railing against gay rights, abortion, diversity, and immigration. To him, Republicans were too tolerant of moderates and too entrenched in the establishment. 
He leaned into racist and homophobic ads, was frequently accused of anti-Semitism, was connected to white supremacists, and frequently defended Nazi war criminals. Rather bafflingly, though, he nominated a conservative black woman as his running mate, Isola B. Foster, which alienated many of his base because, you know, he was a flagrant racist and supported by flagrant racists. Buchanan would go on to win less than half of 1% of the national vote, but he did shockingly well in one consequential state. Florida. If you'll recall, the 2000 election came down to Florida, where George Bush was declared the winner of the state by a 537 vote margin over Al Gore. In one county, Palm Beach, Buchanan mysteriously performed with flying colors given the county's demographics. Didn't make sense. The likely culprit? The infamous butterfly ballot. A ballot designed so flawed, so absurd, that it likely altered the arc of history. The circle designated for Pat Buchanan appeared second, directly under the circle designated for George Bush. But the name listed directly under Bush was Al Gore. It's speculated, given how inconsistent the results were in Palm Beach County compared to the demographics, that many, many people selected the second circle, thinking that it was a vote for Gore, when it was actually a vote for Buchanan. It's thought that at least 2,000 Democratic voters mistakenly voted for Buchanan instead of Gore because of that ballot design. Reminder that Bush won by 537 votes in Florida. Bush won the presidency, the 9-11 attack happened a year later, and we entered a war that lasted decades and cost thousands of lives, not to mention the environmental reforms Gore ran on that Bush never enacted. It's impossible to know how things would be different if a single ballot hadn't given a single third party candidate an accidental boost. But it is kind of maddening and a little heartbreaking to think about. Though of course Buchanan is only one of the third party candidates that ran in 2000. There was another who also dealt a frankly more fatal and decisive blow to Gore's election chances, and that was Ralph Nader. Unlike Buchanan's far-right extremism, Nader represented the hopes of the progressive left through his platform supporting campaign finance reform, universal health care, affordable housing, free higher education, a living wage, marijuana legalization, criminal justice reform, environmental protections, and increased corporate taxes. Ideas that, a quarter century later, progressives are still calling for, and little progress has been made, if any. Nader believed that Republicans and Democrats would never listen to the will of the people without a decisive challenge, and he saw little difference between the two parties who he saw as nothing more than corporate sellouts. He refused to back down, even as it became clear that he posed a threat to Gore's chance of winning. He insisted he had no responsibility to Gore and that both Republicans and Democrats were bad options, suggesting that Democrats could maybe learn a lesson or two and be energized if Gore failed. Nader far outperformed fellow third party candidate Pat Buchanan, winning nearly 3 million votes, including over 97,000 in Florida the state where Bush won by 537 votes. Nader is of course important to mention as a third party candidate who had a huge impact on the outcome of an election, but I wanna bring back Buchanan again, because despite his resounding defeat in the 2000 election, Trump and other far right political actors saw what he was doing in 2000. By the time Obama was elected in 2008, they had gathered steam with Trump at the helm of the birther movement against Obama and Tea Party candidates gaining new ground in backlash to the election of the first black liberal president. Trump briefly floated running for president in 2012, eventually backing down. And by 2016, Trump had been considering a presidential bid of some form for nearly 30 years. And he'd been watching in the sidelines to see what got people riled up. Does this make him a political mastermind? Absolutely not. I bring this up to emphasize once again, the important role that third party candidates have played in changing the national conversation, for better or for worse, even in ways that aren't apparent until decades later. Okay, so we've covered who the third party candidates are this year and how they've played a role in past presidential elections, but this all begs the question, why is it like this? Why can't a third party candidate gain enough traction to actually win? Why is it always the argument that a vote for a third party candidate is a throwaway vote or a vote in favor of the opposing party? Well, there's a pretty simple explanation. It's how we've always done it. The United States journey towards a two party system began shortly after its founding, despite the constitution making no mention of political parties and many of the founders explicitly fearing a system with only two powerful parties. Early political divisions emerged during George Washington's presidency with federalists led by Alexander Hamilton and democratic Republicans led by Thomas Jefferson forming around differing visions of the federal government's role. One wanted power in the hands of the centralized federal government. The other was concerned with decentralization and 
protecting states' rights. This divide laid the groundwork for the two-party system, which was further solidified in the subsequent formation of the Democratic Party and the Whig Party, the latter eventually giving way to the Republican Party. These early factions were not merely differences in opinion, but were rooted in fundamental disagreements specifically over the federal government's role. And we've been fighting about that ever since. Over time, the specifics of the disagreements have evolved, but the design of our winner-takes-all electoral system has continuously driven American politics towards a two-party structure. This winner-takes-all electoral system, also known as a single-winner plurality election, favors the emergence of two dominant parties by penalizing smaller parties. This is known as Duverger's Law. Voters acting strategically tend to support their most preferred electable candidate to avoid wasting their vote on a candidate with no realistic chance of winning. This strategic behavior, coupled with the U.S. primary process, favors maintaining debates and divides over issues within the two major parties because smaller factions have no chance of winning in a winner-takes-all system, making it challenging for third parties to emerge and sustain themselves. And as our country has become even more polarized, to the point where your political party becomes a part of your personal identity, the two parties not only represent different policy preferences, but also fundamentally different visions for the future of our nation. And this raises the perceived stakes in electoral outcomes, making the idea of supporting third parties or independent candidates even less palatable to many voters who see each election as a critical battle over the very soul of the nation. Compare this to a system of proportional representation, like in Denmark. Denmark's constitution is newer than ours. When ours was written, winner-take-all elections were the norm, and proportional representation was pretty much unheard of. But today, most democracies favor some form of proportional representation in at least part of their national government. This is because it's impossible to represent the complex and interdependent desires of the electorate within just two parties. Certain voices will always be left out. The development of proportional representation accounts for that. Denmark employs an open list proportional representation system within multi-member districts. So the districts are large, and politicians are less connected to geographical location and more connected to their party. Voters then either endorse a party as a whole or select individual candidates within a party's list. The total votes garnered by a party or its candidates directly influence the party's share of seats in the legislature, ensuring that the distribution of seats mirrors the proportion of votes received by each party. For instance, in a hypothetical five-member district where five parties each secure 20% of the vote, each party would be awarded one seat typically filled by its most popular candidate. This system effectively merges the primary and general elections, allowing voters to simultaneously express their party preference and support for individual candidates. And this system has tons of benefits. By accommodating multiple parties in the legislature, the system ensures a broader representation of political perspectives, making it more likely that voters will find a party or candidate that aligns more closely with their views. The use of larger multi-member districts dilutes the impact of gerrymandering, because representatives are less tied to their local district, so drawing lines becomes less influential on election outcomes. And since no single party has managed to secure an outright majority in the Danish parliament since 1909, parties are incentivized to form coalitions. This requirement fosters a political culture of negotiation and consensus, as seen in the formation of ruling coalitions that often include leaders from different parties assuming key government roles. Denmark's system encourages a high level of political engagement, with voter turnout consistently surpassing that seen in country with majoritarian or winner-takes-all electoral systems. This model supports a multi-party landscape where political conflicts are more likely to lead to dialogue and compromise rather than entrenched polarization. And this environment contributes to a politically informed and engaged citizenry, less prone to extreme partisanship. Denmark's successful use of proportional representation underscores the potential benefits of adopting similar electoral reforms in countries like the U.S. with rigid two-party systems. By transitioning to a proportional representation system, countries could mitigate the divisive effects of binary political contests, encouraging greater voter participation, and ensuring a legislature that more accurately reflects the diversity of the electorate's political preferences. And this isn't just a pipe dream. The United States genuinely could move towards a proportional representation model. Many states and local elections already are. According to the Pew Research Center, 261 jurisdictions in the U.S., ranging from the state of California to the Yoakum, Texas Independent School District, have adopted some 
voting method other than the standard single winner plurality system most American voters know. The most common alternative voting system is ranked choice voting, where voters rank candidates by preference, and then if no candidate gets a majority, rankings are used to reallocate the loser's votes until one candidate does get the majority. Maine is the only state that currently uses alternative voting extensively, after a 2018 voter passed initiative approved widespread use of ranked choice voting. It's used in Maine for primary and general elections for U.S. senators, representatives, and the president, as well as for primaries for governor and state legislators. Minneapolis, where I live, also uses ranked choice voting. And I'll say it's pretty straightforward and hasn't led to mass confusion, though we do have a trash mayor who somehow keeps getting reelected. Sorry, Jacob, I know you slid into my DMs trying to defend yourself the other day, but you're still incredibly unlikable. So change towards alternative voting systems that disfavor an entrenched two-party system is happening at the local level. States could choose to independently adopt alternative voting systems so that eventually we're all voting in a patchwork of ways that collectively move us away from a two-party system. Or Congress could take up the fight and pass a national law that changes how elections happen uniformly nationwide. It wouldn't take a constitutional amendment. The Constitution leaves states to decide their own rules, but also reserves to Congress the power to intervene. And Congress has used this power repeatedly over the years to enforce the very winner-takes-all single-member districts that keep the two-party system in place and ensure that most elections are uncompetitive. Of course, a federal law would require a level of consensus in Congress that's unlikely, especially given the fact that the very entrenched politicians who benefit from the two-party winner-takes-all system are the ones who would have to make the change happen. And they're currently bought out by billionaires who benefit from our polarization and infighting and who would be threatened by outsiders and progressive candidates that would start gaining more traction if we moved away from a winner-takes-all system. So this probably has to happen at a local level. FairVoteAction.org is a nonprofit organization pushing for these types of reforms at the local and federal level. They provide resources for pushing for local proportional voting reform, and they have worked on pushing national legislation like the Fair Representation Act, which would create multi-member districts and ranked choice voting in the House of Representatives. The bill was last introduced in June 2021 and died in committee. Classic. Go to fairvoteaction.org to learn about their work and how you can get involved to make change happen where you live. Thank you to my Patreon community and my YouTube members for supporting the research and work that goes into these videos. Consider checking out my Patreon community linked below or clicking the big blue join button below to become a member here on YouTube. You'll be supporting my work and getting access to special extra content. You can also get early access to next week's video, exclusive live streams, and so much more. The extra content is the same whether you join as a YouTube member or on Patreon. Your support helps to keep these videos free for for everyone and further our mission towards legal and political education for all. Shout out to my newest supporters as well as supporters in my royal tiers and a very special shout out to my multi-platinum supporters, Joshua Cole, Thomas Johnson, Sophia Sams, Anthony Giles, and Brett Piantek. Your generosity makes this channel what it is, so thank you. If you like this video, you'll probably also like my video about whether you have a moral obligation to vote for Biden or not. Thanks so much for watching, have a good day, Bye bye